half of the oil was rendered by physical or chemical methods, and the other half was unknown at the time. Metagenomic techniques allowed researchers to study microbial communities, which revealed their ability to degrade oil or hydrocarbons. Researchers say that the Gulf of Mexico was primed for the oil spill since natural hydrocarbon seepages are prevalent in the area. Natural hydrocarbon seepages are the natural re release of oil or gas through the Earth's crust. A study by Zhao et al. focusing on the response or focusing on microbial communities and their response to natural hydrocarbon seepages found that microbial communities can be significantly altered in the presence of hydrocarbon seepages. This data set consists of seven samples, five are from natural seep sites, and then there's two reference sites. Additionally, 88 to 90% of the sequences in the data set remain unidentified and or they remain unidentified per sample and regardless of the level of classification, which makes this novel data set interesting to explore. Zhao et al. represents the majority of his data using bar charts. This captures the complexity of the microbial community and also presents some challenges. So for example, looking at the bar chart here, we can see that it provides information about the abundant species. So we see that Euarchaeota is most abundant in these seep samples, but it gets confusing to compare the rare species because of the stacked nature of the plot. Visualizing the data differently encourages exploration of the taxonomic similarities and dissimilarities between the samples and their metadata. The objective of this project was to perform an exploratory analysis of the metagenomes using Jetstream. I'll show four other ways to explore the taxonomic differences between the samples looking at the data differently in R. So when you first get a sample, you want to determine if it's representative of the larger population to prevent bias. A rarefaction curve shows the number of sequences in the samples and the number of species identified in the samples. A representative, a rarefaction curve that shows a representative population will increase exponentially as new species are identified and then start to plateau as unique species are identified like it's shown here in the graph. So from this graph, we can determine that our sample is representative of the larger microbial community in the Gulf of Mexico. Next, to look at the relationship between the samples and spot anomalies based on the taxonomic profiles, I used ordination plots such as a principal component analysis, a PCA, and a non-metric multi-dimensional scaling, an NMDS. Both of these plots show that the seep samples and the reference samples cluster together respectively, showing their higher correlations of the, of the microbial profiles between them. Focusing on the PCA, the arrows show the direction and strength of the taxa families, which drive the distribution of the samples. The hominidae family consists of human and ape DNA, so from this we can conclude that our data set has some sort of contamination. Additionally, this point up or this sample up here was plotted away from the others, which led us to take a closer look using an alluvial plot. The alluvial plot showed us that this sample has characteristics from all sites, and I won't be showing this plot because of time. But the last method I have to visualize the taxonomic differences across the samples is a heat map. A heat map is a table of numerical values with a color scale. 
The heat map shows that Homo sapiens is most abundant across the samples, which confirms that there is some sort of human contamination in the data set. So our results align with Zhao et al. and reveal that the samples are representative and that a quality control step will be needed to remove the contamination. The input data in the scripts that I used to make the plots are available in GitHub on a Jupyter notebook for public use to support other researchers that are working with similar data sets. So while these visualizations show differences between the samples, uh, statistical methods would have to be applied in order to determine if they are significant. Um, overall, with the exploratory analysis of novel data sets like this one, we're able to learn more about the complex systems in the ocean and mitigate the effects of future environmental disasters like the BP oil spill as oil industries continue to drill deeper and farther offshore. Thank you all for listening to me. Um, I've worked hard on this and I've had a lot of help. And if you guys have questions, I guess put them in the chat and Winona will tell me them. <laughs> anyone has a question uh, for Haley, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, ah, Dennis Scannon, question from Dennis. How did you use Jetstream? Um, I used Jetstream to, um, we installed R and Jupyter Notebooks on it because the data set that we used was large, was really big, so it wouldn't it have been fun to run it on my local computer, which is why we use Jetstream. Very good, thank you. Okay, uh, this one's from Dave Hancock. Um, uh, in what ways do you feel this built on your prior REU experience? And what were the benefits or challenges of doing this virtually? That's the ultimate question that everybody wants to know. Um, last or in my sophomore year, I learned like a little bit about like coding and like bash commands, but um, so I kind of took everything that I learned there and I also learned about like metagenomics and like that whole area. So I was able to carry that over to this project. And from this project, I learned a lot about R. I didn't know much about R before, so I spent a lot of time learning R, which is a struggle, and just making the plots are a struggle, but um, I was able to figure it out based on like reading documentation and like examples and stuff, but it was definitely a challenge. What about, um, can you speak to the benefits or and or challenges of doing an REU experience remotely? Um, a lot of it, well, I feel like I, it's hard to do stuff when you're not like going anywhere. So it, that was like a struggle for me to like, just like sit down and work and get things done. And um, I can't think of anything, yeah. Like, no, good answer, thank you. Uh, I've got two more questions. Did your project, this is from Jonathan, uh, one of your fellow REU participants. Um, Dave Hancock says, uh, we feel your pain too. Thanks, Haley. Um, to, back to Jonathan's question. Did your project rely on spe uh, specific features um, or packages in R? And do you think it could be replicated, um, the figures and so on, replicated in another language like Python? Um. Well, for every different plot that I have, it used a different package. Mm -hmm. So I had to like learn the functions from those packages to make the plots. And I'm not sure if you can, I bet you could probably, but I don't have experience. I don't have that much experience in Python to like answer that. 
No, that's good. Okay, uh, last question from Matt Vaughn. Uh, what do you wish Jetstream could do to make your work easier? Hmm. I'm not sure. I feel like I didn't run into problems with the jet stream, really. One thing that, <laughs> one thing was um, when I installed Jupyter Notebooks and I was running Jupyter Notebooks on the web desktop VM, so it was like an interface, it was like kind of difficult because it's so small, but then we, figured out how to tunnel into it so I could open it on my on a web browser. So that was that was nice to figure out. Good. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Haley. Thank you, guys.